sublime abidings start with goodwill and end with equanimity. And in a sense, there's a hierarchy there. Equanimity is more peaceful than goodwill. But without the goodwill, equanimity turns into indifference and coldness, which I don't think is what the Buddha had in mind when he was teaching equanimity. You have to start with goodwill, a desire for happiness, a happiness that is lasting, a happiness that is harmless. And part of being harmless is that you realize if your happiness does harm somebody else, they're not going to stand for it. So it's not going to last. So harmless and lasting go together. You have to think about what that means, goodwill. It's not that by spreading thoughts of goodwill to others, we say, may you be happy simply as you are, whatever you're doing. If people are doing unskillful things, you hope that they can change their ways. And if you're able to help in that endeavor, you're happy to do it. This counteracts the ill will that we sometimes feel when we see someone harming people that we love or people we're concerned about. And this part of the mind says, well, I'd like to see them suffer a little bit. They get a taste of what they've been handing out to other people. But you think about it, when, sometimes when people are suffering from their unskillful actions, they don't stop. They can often become even more and more unskillful. So you're hoping for understanding and a willingness to act on the understanding and the ability to act on the understanding, but at least the understanding is the important part. So think what that means. We're wishing for happiness, and what it comes down to is we're wishing that people have understanding. All too often the sublime abidings are treated as something separate, say, from the Four Noble Truths. There was a book years back, what the Buddha taught, that treated the Four Sublime Abidings as kind of an addendum tacked on to the end. It didn't seem to fit in with the rest of the discussion, which was on the Four Noble Truths. But that's not the case. Goodwill is intimately connected with right view. As the Buddha said at one point, if you have ill will, you've got wrong view. So if there's any sense of resentment, any desire for revenge, that's wrong view. And particularly, it's in that phrase we have, or the phrases we have when we chant. One of them is, aware to hold to. May all beings be free from animosity. The word animosity here, vera in Pali, it's hard to get a precise equivalent in English. It's basically the animosity that comes when two people have been mistreating each other, and they just keep back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You did it to me, I'm going to do it to you. That's the attitude. It's very closely related to the idea, or the attitude that wants to get revenge. And this can go on for lifetime after lifetime. This is why an important part of goodwill is also forgiveness. There was an article recently saying that forgiveness has no role in the teaching of karma. And it's true that you're forgiving someone else for having abused you is not going to erase their karma. You're not the owner of their karma. But forgiveness does help avoid future unfortunate actions. In other words, you realize that this back and forth has gone on long enough. You're not going to try to continue it. You're not going to try to get back at somebody. 
and so you forgive them for that last instance, and make up your mind that you're going to pose them no danger. The word abaya, at least in Thai, is used to mean forgiveness. It literally means danger-free. So forgiveness, goodwill, understanding, all these things go together. And then as they get applied to specific cases, then they turn into compassion and empathetic joy. In other words, you see someone who is doing something really unskillful or is suffering the results of unskillful actions, and you feel compassion for them. If you see someone who's doing things that are skillful, that will lead to happiness, or are already experiencing the happiness, you're happy for them. There's no resentment, there's no jealousy. So all these attitudes go together. Equanimity stands apart a little bit. It's the realization that if all you want is for happiness, but it's not happening, there's going to be pain. The Buddha talks about that as renunciate pain, especially when it's related to your own practice, but also when you're feeling goodwill for others and see that they're simply not going to be happy. We say, may all beings be happy, be happy, be happy. But you look at people and they're doing a lot of things that are not going to lead to happiness and they're not going to change. And if you don't develop equanimity, there's going to be a lot of suffering. This is for your own protection and for the protection of the other person. Sometimes your efforts at helping can get pretty desperate and can do more harm than good. Or you're in your desire to get along, your desire to do what people want. You can do harm, because there are times when what they want is not the right thing. And so you have to pull out and have some equanimity for the fact that they may resent your pulling out or not helping them the way they want to be helped. But again, equanimity, like goodwill, has to be based on understanding. Realization that you're not giving up in the search for happiness. Simply you're focusing in areas where it will have an effect. The primary effect, of course, is going to be in your own actions. If you find that you're doing something unskillful, this is not an area where you can have equanimity. You just can't just let it go or be content with it, or say, well, this is the way I have to be. You've got to do what you can not to give in. I've met a lot of people who say, well, give me some time. It's going to take me a while to sort of start getting more skillful in my actions. But it's not a question of, are giving those people time? The question is, do they have that time? That figure of death that we see in cartoons doesn't wait around and say, well, this person has enough time to get their act together. Now I'll come and visit. They come at any time, unannounced, unbidden. So in terms of your own actions, if you see that you've got something unskillful, this is where you have to have lots of goodwill for your desire for true happiness. So I'm just not i keep on giving in, giving in, giving in to my unskillful desires. I've got to do something about this. Where that comes in in terms of your own experience is when you're dealing with the results of past bad actions that you can't change. You have to accept that okay, this is the way things are. Certain things you can't work your way around. But even there, you've got to figure out, well, how do I not suffer? After you have the acceptance, then there's the next step, which is, even though there's pain, and I've learned to accept that there's going to be pain, how do I not suffer from the pain? That's something different. That requires more wisdom. Learning how to separate the pain, say, say if it's a physical pain, separate it from your awareness, and separate the pain from your sense of the body.
That's when you can free the mind again, through understanding. So there's less willing in terms of the equanimity there. There's more understanding that cuts through the connection that would cause suffering. As for your dealings with other people, you focus on the people you can help. You don't have to have equanimity, equanimity for cases where you can't. So for all the Brahma-viharas, all the sublime abidings, it requires understanding. For these things really to lead to the happiness that we want. And the happiness we want is one that spreads itself around. It's not like the happiness of the world is based on gaining status, gaining fame, gaining wealth. Where one person gains, somebody else has to lose. For the happiness that comes from the practice, we gain, the people around us gain. As we gain in wisdom, as we gain in compassion, we gain in purity of our actions. We cause less suffering to others and can actually bring them a measure of happiness. I've talked to some people who've said that simply knowing that there is a monastery here in Southern California where people are practicing warms their heart, even though they can't come. So you never know to what extent your, your practice is going to have a good effect on somebody else. But just be confident that the goodness does spread around. Some people are more receptive. Some people are less, but it does spread around. 